So an unsurprising result for South Africa Tonga. I think there was it was still a good game, and I think there's a lot to learn, especially on the South African side, as this is the last chance they're probably gonna. Well, not probably. This is the last chance they're gonna have to play before they go into the quarterfinals. So uh, I, I don't think it's the result that's so important as uh, what, what what can we gather from this South African side that obviously come, obviously come for very tough loss against Ireland previously. So what did I see? Well, Andre Pollard coming in is really key. As the commentators were talking about, he's only had a roughly 30 minutes playing in the Premiership Cup for Leicester so far. Uh, and he's come straight over into the South African squad after the ACL injury for Malcolm Marks. And I think it was a really good opportunity to give him some minutes under his belt at international rugby. Obviously he hasn't played a lot since the premiership last year and he was solid. He was good. He was Andre Pollard. He was kind of the perfect Leicester fly half. What do I mean by that? Well, great decision maker, never makes any wrong decisions, puts your team in the right positions of the field and enables the big boys enables the forwards to win the game for you. And he still has that just little bit of flair in terms of his passing and his ability to break out of tackles as well. That just makes him just that little bit more. He's, he's, yeah, he's sensational. And for South Africa, I think he's probably a, a welcome change of pace considering what happened with Libok against Ireland. Obviously, I, I've talked about before having the juxtaposition between Libok and uh, Pollard, which could be really sensational for South Africa. Uh, for example, you, you come in against Ireland and in the situation where you've got Libok on the pitch, maybe instead of going for full bomb squad 7-1, you go for 6-2 and you have Pollard on the bench. Libok isn't managing to get the ball out, so... He's not well. Isn't he? He can't play out in the open because there's jackals all around. Maybe you bring Pollard and you have a different change of pace and you let the forwards win the game. And having Pollard in the squad really allows them to change the pace of the game to how they want to play, uh, and it can allow them to play two very different styles of rugby that South Africa are very very good at doing both styles. So really important for him to get some game time. It was great to see him solid. He's not really someone I think would get a knock in confidence that easily, but anyone with an injury that's been out for that long, you would understand if he looked a little bit rusty. He didn't. That's great. Great for South Africa. I think it was weird that Mapimpi went off so early. Uh, reports were that it was a HIA, but he looked fully coherent and you would have expected him to come back on the pitch. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, uh, but he seemed to be perfectly fine when he came off the pitch and he never came back. If it is a HIA, hopefully he's okay. Uh, hopefully that's not too bad. For Re at the age of 37, coming in and playing hooker, to be honest with you, any time a player, especially later on in their career, comes in to, uh, comes in to play a different position, <coughs> fills me with nerves. I always think back to, must be a decade plus now, where we, we saw Bergamasco come in and try and play scrum half in the Six Nations game, and it just went horribly, but... Marie was solid. He did the specialist things that Hooker needed to do. He scrummaged well. His lineouts were perfect. I don't know if it, I don't know if it was 100%, but it didn't look like they, they lost the pace. And he was a great addition into that, into that pack at a number two position. So great. You know, you managed to lose Malcolm Marks, bring in Andre Pollard and not really lose anything and by having two hookers within the squad or even three in that regard. So Great news for South Africa in their in their squad and in their hookers. Obviously, Malcolm Marks isn't replaceable, but <coughs> excuse me, at least you can have uh, you can have a bonus in another part of the field that's probably just as good as Malcolm Marks in the form of Andre Pollard. Right, he's still a very world class fly half, and you don't lose too much in the hooker position for that sacrifice. So, really good squad management for by South Africa for that. I, I think. Libok slotting every single one of his kicks since he came on from what I've seen is really key. To be honest with you, it, it, as I said in the review game that I had for the Ireland South Africa Ireland South Africa game, they lost the game because Libok didn't hit his kicks. Fafra Cloak obviously missed a couple, but they were very long range. Libok hit every single one of his kicks since he came on. And I was hoping to maybe see a little bit more from Libok when he came on, but we I never really got to see the breakout attacking rugby that he was famous for. I, I hope this is just situational and he wasn't given enough time on the pitch. Obviously, he was brought on about the 55-minute mark. But yeah, it, it would be a shame for him to go within his shell after he's played so well over the last few weeks and uh, having a 
out of character poor performance against Ireland hopefully hasn't shaken confidence or anything like that he's a fantastic fly half and look forward to seeing him playing inside the knockout stages I think not having Snyman start or on the bench is quite telling so what I'm talking about is I think the heart of the bomb squad is Snyman someone who could start for pretty much any international team other than maybe New Zealand he I mean he could still compete with New Zealand in terms of the quality of Brody Retallick and Scott, uh, Scott Barrett and Sam, Sam Whitelock. But I think it's telling that he got zero game time. They're keeping him fresh. They're keeping him as that heart of the bomb squad rather than risking him through injury and giving him tons of game time. I think that was obvious. But maybe, you know, maybe I'm reading too, in- too much into it. Maybe he's had a, like an injury in camp and he's nursing it and they're keeping it quiet. I don't know. But for me, I think that was kind of telling. Obviously, South Africa, as I've mentioned at least three or four times now, famous for the bomb squad. But I think it's a real shame because they have some great backs that they can select from that never quite make it into that starting 15. Andre Esterhazen had a good game. Not an amazing game, had a good, solid game. And I really think having him and Delanda, Delande, Delanda in the squad is really a situation of, opening, uh, of iron sharpening iron. Delande uh, has basically had some hot competition in the warm-up games. Esther Hazen has looked superb. In the Rumby Championship, Esther Hazen looks superb. And I think that's just spurred up the competition between the two of them for the 12 shirt. And it's just making them play each other. It make, makes each of them play better. So that's really good for South Africa. Willie LaRue, I think, had a solid game. Moody had a solid game. Uh, 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 some of the many of the backs had great games, and it is just a shame that you know they have this bomb squad tactic. I mean, it's not a shame for South Africa; they win games with it, and their forwards are great as well. But they have such a wealth of players that they can br- they can bring in and rely on, and it's a shame that these backs sometimes don't get more game time. But hey, when you have a winning formula, why get away from it? It'd be remiss not to talk about Tonga a little bit. I think this is probably Tonga's best game of the tournament. They look really solid. I think. At the beginning of the game, I didn't quite understand why they didn't go for three points. They kept insisting on going for the corner and it didn't work out for them. It really depends on how they're looking at this game, right? Whether they're looking at this as like a developmental opportunity or if they want to get a win against South Africa. Two very different tactics. You want to go for the corner and build your attack and try and build a move that works against the best defense in the world. Maybe that's what you're trying to do. So I can't fault them for that. Maybe that's what they were trying. You know, if you, if you can work out if there's a move that you can do that can get you over the five-meter line, five line against South Africa with the players you have, it's sure going to work against the vast majority of teams in the world. So maybe I don't blame Tonga not for trying to go for that winning mentality of going for the three when they have the opportunity to. And to be honest with you, later in the game, they went for lineouts and they ended up grinding it and getting it over the try line, which is really impressive. And it wasn't anything that was too overly complex. It was... Uh, pick and goes, uh, crashing off the first mine, uh, f- crashing off the first man, going on a golden uh, golden angle on the line and trying to get the attack uh, onto the defense like that and then spreading it wide when the opportunity was there. So good phase rugby, something that we've not seen from Tonga majorly. So that was really cool. Tonga also had a line out move that I noted as saucy. But they popped it off to the uh, captain tight head to come straight down the middle channel. It didn't work at the beginning of the game because on that uh, inside channel, the South Africans typically put their hooker and it was just big man against big man. But later in the game, this actually made some breaks because for some reason South Africa moved their scrum half into that inside channel, even though Tonga had tried this move a couple of times um, and it worked a little bit more more effectively so that was that was cool it was cool to see Tonga getting created at the line out uh, you know it's not been a strong suit for them but uh it was actually really solid this game and I you can't fault them for that their tight play was much improved and uh, they've got a lot to build on uh, into the future so and yeah I I, I again it, it's just a change in tactics really for me I I think I got a little bit frustrated with Tonga not taking the three uh, they kept going for the corner and I felt I, I felt this at the time maybe a little bit confusing. You know, you've just seen Ireland play South Africa and Ireland couldn't even score what they couldn't even score like fifteen points against South Africa. What makes you think that you can score that many points against South Africa? But again, maybe maybe they're just building to try and build an attack and build a game plan and they weren't too bothered about what the numbers were at the end and they were more thinking if we can have an attacking plan that can score a try against South Africa in situational rugby, we'll have confidence to take that into the future. So Maybe it was just a, 
a, a, a conscious coaching decision to maybe go for the corners and maybe try and build off moves that will score tries rather than trying to eke out wins with three points. So the refereeing decisions of the yellow and the red cards almost turned their ugly heads once more in this game. There were two occasions where I had major questions for even going to a TMO. I think Luke Pierce was way too keen to get a card out against Evan Etzebeth when there was a high ball and he just got caught basically with a guy, you know, falling in front of him and his shoulder grazes like another shoulder and somehow it's a penalty. There was another situation where a Tongan player was pretty much falling over and uh, Luke Pierce was pretty keen again to get a card out and... I think this whole thing just needs a whole review by the end of the World Cup. It's, uh, we need to, I understand that we've swung the pendulum to player safety and that's really important, but something has to come back and swing the pendulum back to more, back, needs to swing back a little bit and come back more towards the middle. And what I mean by that is that I think we need to have a serious look at what's malicious and what's not malicious. If something's not malicious, give a penalty, sure. If something's reckless, sure, give a yellow card. But if someone is standing underneath a kick and they're not getting too far involved in the game, if someone is falling over when trying to make a tackle and accidentally accidentally bangs a head, come on, guys. We just need to... just need to let these certain small accidental incidents get away. Like, just We need to just like, let it go. And I think... Even looking things in slow-mo as well sometimes gives a false impression of what really happens during the game. Things in slow-mo, you've got to remember, you're, you're, it's an obvious thing to say, but you're condensing a very short amount of time and expanding it out, right? And it makes things sometimes look worse than they really are. Things happen in snap decisions. I mean, anybody that's played rugby, these guys are playing at a pace that's just, you know... It's out of this world. Nothing that you've ever experienced. And sometimes people don't have decisions. They don't, they don't make decisions. They just get caught out being in the wrong position. So I feel like there needs to just be a little bit more, a little bit more intelligence played into this. And yeah, I think Tonga really worked well for those tries that they scored. This could have turned out like some of these other tier two nations or tier three nations playing against a tier one nation. And it just turned into like a hundred nil or something like that. But I think Tonga did some really good attacking work to go into the corners and get the tries that they did. And they were well worked and really gritty tries, especially against South Africa, who are obviously known for their physicality to kind of push their way over the line, I thought was really impressive. So Tonga, really good, really good development stuff for the future. I don't think they were, they were where Fiji at as a comparison, but they're on their way. They're looking better uh, towards the end of the tournament. So that's really great. In South Africa, this is a great, tune-up game to get them back into winning ways going into the quarterfinals so yeah that's it for me for this game